Hello everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and today I have another fun mechanism for you. So pause this video now, give it a try, and once you have your mechanism, resume this video and we'll go over it together. You got it? Alright, let's look what we have here. So the first thing that I'm always going to look when I'm analyzing my reactions is what type of reagents I'm looking at. So here I have ethanol, and we know that ethanol is a polar product solvent, but also on top of that, it is also a poor nucleophile, which may or may not come in handy when we are dealing with the mechanism of this reaction. The next important thing for us to identify is going to be the presence of the living group and the position of the living group in the molecule. So here I have my bromine as a leaving group, and that is a secondary position, which means that the leaving group dissociation here is possible and it can give us a corresponding carbocation. We see that this reaction gives some sort of a rearrangement because the skeleton does not resemble what we have to begin with, so the most likely pathway for that would be through the carbocation rearrangement, which does mean that we need to be able to form the carbocation to begin with. So now, when we know that we are dealing with polar product solution, we have a poor nucleophile and we have the secondary alkyl halide, we can look at our predictive model and decide what type of a mechanism we are going to be looking at. And when it comes to our predictive model, I'm going to remind you here real quick that we can have different types of reagents. We can have a nucleophile only reagent, we can have a base slash nucleophile, we can have base only and we can have poor base in a nucleophile, which is exactly the situation that we have right now. The position of our leaving group can also be primary, secondary or tertiary. So in our case here we have the secondary leaving group and we have poor base slash nucleophile, so what we are looking at is possible SN1E1 style mechanism. And since we do not have any kind of indication of the elevated temperature, the most likely mechanism in this case is going to be an SN1 mechanism. So how does the SN1 mechanism usually start? With the leaving group dissociation. So first of all, let's redraw our molecules to make writing this mechanism a little bit more manageable. All right, there we go. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is going to be my leaving group dissociation. So I'm going to show the bromine popping of our molecule like this, giving us the corresponding secondary carbocation. And since it is a secondary carbocation, it can easily rearrange to give us something more stable. So right next to it, right over here, we've got a quaternary position, and on the other side we have another secondary position. We don't really care about the other secondary position because uh, rearranging onto that carbon is not going to give us increase in the stability of the carbocation, so it's not going to be likely, however the quaternary position is a different story. When it comes to the quaternary position there are two possibilities here. We can have either the alkyl shift giving us the ring expansion, or we can have a phenyl shift giving us a tertiary carbocation. So let's look at both of those and see which one going to give us a better carbocation. If I were to go with the final shift like this, I would end up with this new tertiary carbocation that looks like this. However, if I were to go with the ring expansion, like this for instance, then in this case we are going to end up with the tertiary carbocation looking like that. So now we have a five-membered ring tertiary carbocation versus a four-member ring and a tertiary carbocation as well. So the bottom pathway is going to give us a more stable carbocation, so in this case the bottom competition is going to win, so we are going to go with this rearrangement and we are going to discard the one where we are moving the phenyl group. Now, once I have my carbocation, which is already as stable as it can possibly be, because there is no way we can make a more stable carbocation, this one is a tertiary carbocation, it is also benzylic, it's right next to an aromatic ring, so it is stabilized by plenty of resonance, so at this point I'm going to be looking at a possible nucleophilic attack. And I have a possible nucleophile here which is going to be an OH inside of my molecule itself, so that's going to be my nucleophile number one, and I also remember that we are doing this reaction in the presence of ethanol as a solvent, so ethanol is our possible nucleophile number two. Now, the question is, which of these two nucleophiles we are going to choose? 
Well, that is actually not much of a choice because we know that if we can do the intramolecular reaction, aka reaction within the molecule itself, or cyclization if you want to think about it this way, that one is going to win from the kinetic perspective. The intramolecular reactions, they are typically at least 10 times faster than intermolecular reactions, aka reactions between the molecules. So given an opportunity, always go with the intramolecular reactions. Always choose the reaction that happens within the molecule itself before anything else. So I'm going to have my oxygen attacking my carbocation like so, giving me the following intermediate. And the last thing that we need to do here in order to get our final product is to get rid of this proton over here, and that is where we can use our ethanol as essentially a base uh, that is going to be floating around and pulling things off our molecule when we need it. So I'm going to take this ethanol molecule and use that as a base to pull my proton off and get my final product. So as you can see, this mechanism combines two of the most common pitfalls of tricky exam questions. We have a complex carbocation rearrangement here involving the ring expansion, and we have the intramolecular reaction resulting in another ring formation. You might think that this reaction is too difficult to actually show up on the test, but actually this example with a few slight modifications literally came from one of my students' practice tests. So I'm not exaggerating when I'm saying that these mechanisms or mechanisms like that are a fair game for the final or the next test. And talking of which, when is your next final or your next test? Let me know in the comments below. Is there a specific topic you are struggling with and want a tutorial on? Don't be shy. In the meantime, if you found this video useful and learned something new today, hit that like button to help promote it and help more students see it. As always, thanks for watching, subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow.